What you're about to listen to is from a conversation we had with Todd McGowan not very long ago here at Theory Underground, now published as a standalone episode. This is part one. Part two will be on shelling and his theory of drive. For now, all I want to say is Michael Downs is teaching an introduction to Zizek course starting next week. You guys, if you don't take the course organized by Mikey, Dave, and so on, you are objectively siding with the enemy. So <laughs> if when we, the people, take power, if you don't want to finish in Gulag or at least in a re-education camp, please take this course. So sign up. A-S-A-P. We're really looking forward to seeing you there. Enjoy this episode. And if you want to learn more about Theory Underground, stick around until the end and watch the PSA or listen to it if you're on podcast. Listen to it and uh, it should give you a good sense for who we are, what we're all about, what we're doing. And then you'll be able to get involved if you want to. Okay, take care. Bye-bye. All right, everybody, welcome to Theory Underground. Welcome back to those who've been here with the live stream, especially those of you who've been watching throughout the day while working. It's so good to have you all here. For people just tuning in, we've been doing this for uh, uh, over 10 hours at this point, and I'm really excited to say we've got Michael Downs and Todd McGowan in the house, and today we're going to be getting into death drive and shelling and death in the phenomenology of spirit, and I don't know what order, but basically it's going to be something close to an hour and a half, and we'll kind of divide it up into two halves, focusing on these two things, I think, unless either of you wants to do something different, you're free to do whatever you want, but Mikey, take it away. Okay, so, yeah, I mean, look, Todd and I had this great conversation a week a week or so ago about shelling, and after I got off the phone with him, I'm like, God damn it, I wish that was, had been recorded. Because, look, I mean, whenever anybody interviews Todd, they're going to talk about his work, or they're going to talk about Hegel, or they're going to talk about Zizek, or they're going to talk about Lacan. And, you know, Todd is... Also, I mean, he spent his life studying German idealism too, right? And so I, I, I've started to develop more and more of an interest in Schelling. Part of it is because I think Schelling is an interesting way of, I mean, look, everybody knows I'm finishing up my Nick Land book, which is a Zizekian critique of Nick Land. And there's a weird way where, you know, you can read Schelling as somebody who's kind of a forerunner for Nick Land's libidinal materialism. And yet, on the other hand, Slavoj reads Schelling into his philosophy at like the most fundamental level. And I think this aspect of how Schelling fits into Zizek's philosophy is often neglected. And so, yeah, I started talking to Todd about it, and I just I was getting so much out of it um, that I'm like, damn, I want to I want to talk to Todd about this on stream at some point. And then the other thing is, so look, I, there's a section of the Nick Land book right now that I'm working on, and there's some quotes from him talking about Hegel. And like, basically, I, I wanted to talk to Todd this week on my own to ask him about what he thinks of these quotes and all this. So it's kind of two birds, one stone, because so much of this has to do with death and has to do with the drives that it all kind of fits together. So, okay. So, all right. I I um, I, I want to just say really quick. I had no idea that Schelling is a theorist of death drive. I just want to put that out there. I had no well, idea. Uh, not that's not that's not it. Um, no? He's a theorist of drive. Drives are these core okay. things. But that's part of what Todd and I will get into here because I'm okay. still wrestling with this. Okay. On some level. So, um, okay. There's one little question. This is like a a little thing i just would email you todd but i just want to know is it true that derrida talking about hegel once said something along the lines of um there's always this risk of the hegelian dialectic capturing whatever you're doing or capturing is, is that somewhat accurate to what derrida said yeah that's his i mean in, in a way that's his critique that's his main critique of hegel that that even when 
no, even when you mount the most uh, effective deconstruction of Hegel's philosophy, he's already accounted for it in his philosophy. And for Derrida, that you might say, well, oh, that seems like a kind of praise of Hegel, but it's actually, that's his critique of Hegel, is that mm -hmm. you can't, there's no room for what doesn't fit. And so that, and, and, and that's part of this anti-system tendency of, of the French, many French thinkers of the late 20th century, right? Like, so, like, I don't think Foucault and Derrida have a lot in common, but that is one thing they have in common. And that's why Nietzsche and Heidegger are their shared parent figures, because they're, they're, they're much more fragmentary and anti-system, whereas Hegel is a whole, he's systematic. And, and for Derrida, that's the way that, that, that's where the system gets its revenge. No matter where you, no matter what you say, counter it, it ends up fitting within it. So yeah, that's, that is definitely his position. So do he has a couple off, of, sorry. He just, no, do you know just off the top of your head where he says it? Yeah, so it's, so it's, it's either in the pit and the pyramid, which is in margins of philosophy, or it's in the essay on Hegel and writing and difference. So it's not in Gla, which is Gla is the big book on Hegel, but it's not. It's 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 a it's a strange uh, book. It's also on Jean Genet. It's like half, and it has two um, two columns the whole book. So it's very hard to read. I mean, it's intentionally hard to read and 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 not disorienting so much. It's just hard to get a sense of what he's trying to do. Uh, but. I think it's in the pit in the pyramid, the, the margins of philosophy. What about, uh, he, he talks about Hegel a lot in positions, right? Right, but that's more, right. So there he's talking about, that's an interview with two Marxists, and mm -hmm. he's, and then I think there's a third interview with uh, like a structural linguist. Um, but there it's mostly Hegel's relationship to Marx and that tradition so, and, and, and dialectics. and So maybe it's in that, yeah. I don't know. I mean, I, 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 I haven't, to be honest, I haven't looked at Derrida in 10 years, probably. So I, that's a distant memory. It's odd because, right, like, Land, one of his least favorite thinkers is Derrida. And yet I yeah. think his critique of Hegel is the same as Derrida's. Well, well that, it, does that make sense? Because they're both anti-system thinkers. I mean, that's, so I think that their critique of Hegel is going to be, is going to be similar along you know, and, and I think on the same level, like you could say Levinas would probably on some in some way agree with. Look, I, I think land main issue is he's going to say, OK, the he Hegelian absolute, the system. Sure, it's completely. Flooded with dialectical negativity, contradiction, but it doesn't allow for radical alterity. There's there's nothing radically outside the the Hegelian absolute, and I mean I would say that's his issue. It, I kind of feel like on some level you could say that with Derrida. I know Levinas would say like you're not gonna capture the radical alterity of the other, right? And so, right. I, I, I but my thing is I guess it is there a way for Hege, the Hegelian absolute to be the way we think about it and still leave room for radical alterity or do we have to own up and just go no all negativity is somehow going to be part of the hegelian absolute yeah i think Derrida says where is it this i this i've looked at more recently he says the problem is that there's no negativity without a profit in hegel right and i think so so he think and this is it's a, it's an interesting extension i think the parent figure for all this critique it's not nietzsche because nietzsche didn't read hegel uh at least he pretended to, but I don't think he did. But it's Heidegger, I think that that, and I think it's the, it's it's precisely uh, Sein zum Tod, being toward death, that he thinks can't be, in being in time at least, and then and then in subsequent lectures on Hegel that he thinks can't be accounted for Hegel, and that he thinks that Hegel turns nothingness into negativity. So it's you see how it's exact. It's in a way the parent of the, all those objections, like Levinas, Derrida, Land, they're all kind of in Heidegger's, in that notion that you're turning this radical nothingness into, which is alterity for Heidegger, into, into once that becomes neg determinate negation, then you've made it fit, right? And, and I, think, I think why that's wrong is it, 
is the way that you and I understand the absolute either in all of its forms, right? Absolute idea, absolute knowing, even the absolute uh, state or absolute work of art. That 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 it that when you get to that point, that's when you encounter this what can't be made to fit, right? Like that's the that like when he says that great line in the like the penultimate page of the phenomenology when he says uh, that that absolute knowing knows both its spirit and absolute knowing spirit knows both itself and the negative or the limit the limit of itself right so it knows its limit and then he says to know one's limit is to know how to sacrifice oneself so that idea i think is exactly what all these thinkers think is not there in hegel so i think it's interesting it's and, I, and, and that it's not in and i think so in a certain sense they're right because where he talks about death say in the preface of the phenomenology uh when he links it to the understanding there it does seem like it's alcohoban or, or sublated right and so yeah then i guess you could say that the death becomes this encounter and and then in the master and servant dialectic the fact that the servant encounters death in the way that the master doesn't is allows is, is what propels the servant to greater consciousness than the master well, okay, then that objection then seems to hold. But that, the, the point is that that's not the only place that this absolute otherness or negativity or nothingness even gets encountered. It really gets encountered at the end. So I think the, the misreading of absolute knowing as like, fit, like containing everything, that's where, to me, that's where the rubber hits the road on this, this question. Yeah, because they, they're, they're going to view it as... In, to talk like D and G, like the Hegelian absolute is the absolute apparatus of capture. Nothing right. escapes it. Right. Right. And but so, but it, but of course the point is, and I, this is where I think they don't see how he's a Kantian, right? Like he, the the absolute as a, the absolute knowing is fundamentally based on the Kantian antinomies, right? So so it's coming to these points that like you take, say, reason for Kant far enough. And you run into insolvable problems, and and that's what Hegel does in the phenomenology. So I, I think that if you, if you don't read it like that, then you're going to miss what is really at stake in the absolute. And they act like, like he, for him, reason is what is this machine of capture. Like it, it machine is what's capturing. Every, reason is what's capturing everything. No, but no, no, it's a complete. See, there, there, I think. Again, I think so many of the errors come from a failure to see him as a, in certain ways, as a Kantian, right? Like, like what is like, Kant completely redefines reason by saying, reason is not what Leibniz thought, not what Descartes thought. Reason is this faculty where we try to go beyond what, what the the possibility, the conditions of possible experience, right? So that's why. So he divides between understanding which knows its boundaries and reason, which goes too far and runs into contradictions. And for Kant, that's why we need a critique of pure reason. But for Hegel, the fact that it knows contradictions is the, that's the power of reason. So you have to think of it in these Kantian, I think, you have to think of Fernunft or reason in this Kantian way, or else it doesn't, then it is, the problem is what you're saying. But yeah. that's not what he, he means. I mean, he thinks, you know, he has that great line where he says Kant has too much tenderness for things themselves and doesn't think that they can be contradictory. But Hegel doesn't have tenderness. He thinks that he thinks thought is actually more uh, powerful than things themselves. And so if thought runs into contradiction, then things must also things must be contradictory. And so that opens up. It seems obvious to me this point of radical alterity. Okay. Todd, this sounds like a great place for me to actually uh ask a question i wasn't going to ask um but tyler murphy uh, he said i i told him maybe i'd ask it like later or something but no i think it, i think it fits right here he said can you guys define dialectics a bit i've been thinking of it as the coincidence of opposites within a position situation entity but would love to hear from you too and i just was thinking you know what you're taught what you're saying you know in this defense of hegel against all of these ways of he, that he has been received by some of our favorite thinkers. Um, I think it, you can you can kind of just address it right there. Sure. Uh, Kyler Murray asked you to ask that. You know him, Tyler Murphy. 
Oh, okay. <laughs> I was going to say, he's taking time out from training camp with the Cardinals and, <laughs> and checking out Theory Underground. That's pretty cool. Uh, I, I think you should have gone with that, Dave, because who cares about Tyler Murphy? Um, uh, I meant, yes. But, I meant, absolutely. Yes, absolutely. Yes, it is him. Yeah. <laughs> uh, anyway, yeah, for sure. Okay. So, dialectics, I don't think what uh, Tyler, I, I care about Tyler Murphy. I'm just kidding. Um, that I, I, I know you're that, joking. <laughs> uh, uh, I have to say a funny story, though. That, that I will answer the question. I'm not just stalling. So I had a joke about in, embracing alienation. About it's in a footnote about Copernicus and how um, it was. It was actually his wife that discovered heliocentrism because she kept trying, or his, she helped him discover it because she kept triangulating in arguments between him and his son. And and or something between him and their their child, and then uh, Copernicus realized, oh, the sun's in the center, and then, and then somebody. So it's not a really good joke; it's kind of a stupid joke. But somebody wrote me and said, um, "I looked up Copernicus. I did some research, and it, it turns out he wasn't married." So this is a really misleading footnote. <laughs> Where'd you get your information? <laughs> and I'm like, man, you got me. I didn't do my proper research on <laughs> Copernicus. Uh, so anyway, so dialectics. So uh, dialectics is, in a sense, the coincidence of opposites. But it's the way in which I think that's a not a bad initial way to think about it. Because I think for Hegel, but I think it needs to be clarified. So I think for Hegel, dialectics, and for me, dialectics is how a thing's identity always depends upon what is other to it. Right. And so that means to understand that you have to understand the totality because everything is in relation to everything else. And so dialectics forces us to think the totality, how everything is in relation. But when you do that, and I think this is, so it's, it's, I think it's considerably more complex. When you do that, then you discover that there is contradiction within the totality. So dialectics is always about discovering the contradiction by thinking all the relationality, thinking all the relations up to the point of their totality. Because if you don't do that, then it seems like there's no contradiction at all. Like you can say, oh, I mean, you can think about this in Marxist terms, right? Like I can say, oh, I, I go to work, I have a boss, my boss tells me what to do, I do it, there's no contradiction. But then if you think about it in terms of the social totality and what's at stake in capitalism, you could say, well, okay, the capitalist pays me a certain amount of money, but then they need me to buy more goods than they've paid for that they paid me to 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 as a salary. So what's how's that gonna square? Right. So there, there's something contradictory about that very structure. So there's all different ways to deal with it, right? Like debt is one way to deal with it, different things. So that's that that's a way that would manifest itself just in terms of capital. Like if you don't think about the totality, you miss the contradiction. So that's Hegel's, that's what Hegel, that's that's dialectics for Hegel. You, you have to think all the relationality. And when you do that, the contradiction becomes apparent. And Mikey, actually this comes right back to what we were just saying, right? Like the absolute is thinking the totality. And when you do that, the contradiction becomes evident and, and radical alterity emerges. Right. I think. I mean, that's how I. That's how I read it. Yeah. And of, and of course, you know, we. Uh, I've only read it in passing. Skim, I skimmed it. Plan, I plan on doing a a real read through of it. But I've uh, I've listened to, uh, capitalism and desire. Right. That is that. That's or no, no sorry. Emancipation after Hegel is the one that um, where you really build this argument. I think. Right. Yeah. 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 That's yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Can I just say too, like to kind of riff off of what you said, I also think it's helpful when we're thinking about dialectics, Tyler. And I'm I'm just saying what I've heard, what I've learned from Todd. But look, like if you go a, a great place to actually start and uh, with reading Hegel is a, we can say phenomenology of spirit, but if if you go, oh, I'm going to go read phenomenology, it's a major undertaking. No, just read the very first section called. Since certainty. It's six or seven pages long. It's super short. 
And if you can really kind of dwell just with that one little section, you're going to get so much if you, and this is the trick, right? You have to start with the right frame of re like how to read it. So look, with sense certainty, consciousness begins and it's trying to know the object. And all it does is go this, right? And by saying this, it's trying to get at the, the object in front of its face, right? Uh, in its pure singularity. It, it, not trying to read interpretations into it. It's trying to know it in its immediacy directly, right? The point is, with language, when you say this, well, we apply that word to every object. So the name actually turns the thing you're trying to say into the absolute most universal term we have. So you're completely, uh, you're finding that sense certainty is shot through with contradictions. And so the, the key with thinking like dialectics is in a sense, like the analysis of opposites or internal opposite, you have to stress this internal aspect. Since certainty, it's not it opposed to some other mode of consciousness. It's not two modes of consciousness that are in opposition. It's how sense certainty itself is completely opposed to itself within its very parameters. It's try it's it, 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 and it's almost you can use Lacanian jargon here, but it's like sense certainty as an ideal image of itself, an ideal ego. This is what it likes to think of itself as. But when it gets into the mud, when when it, when it gets into the analysis, it finds that it's the complete opposite of its ideal ego, and so. It does this in different ways. Well, I try to say this. Well, this is the most universal term. Well, then I try to say here. Well, here is every here, right? It, there, here, 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 here. Anywhere I look is here. Same with now, right? Every moment is now. So it's trying to get it. It, it wants to know the thing in its singularity. To, to, to know it, it has to express it in language. To express it in language with these terms is to actually say the most universal thing. And so it's at it's at, it's contradictory within itself. And that is the key thing I've learned from Todd. And that's what unlocked phenomenology of spirit for me. For me, I always went in with the damn thesis, antithesis, synthesis thing. And so when I'm in sense certainty, I'm trying to go, all right, where's the thesis? Where's the antithesis? How are they combined? And then how does that combination of the two pivot us into perception? I never could figure out. It doesn't fucking work that way. That's the problem. What you have to do, if you go read the sense certainty thing, here's how you approach it. You go, okay, sense certainty is going to try to live up to its own ideal image of itself. It completely fails. And it keeps trying and trying again to live up to its own image of itself. And the trick is to see how it contradicts itself and fails to be that. And that it's through these moments of contradiction that you learn something new that gets you to see things in a different way. And that's what pivots you into perception. It's just the failures of sense certainty to be what it wants to be that gets you to see things in a new way. And that's, that is what has unlocked that text for me. And I didn't get that from Slavoj. I didn't get that from Kojev. I got that from Todd. It's it, Todd's the one who is the one who really unlocked how to begin to read this text for me. And so that's how I approach it. Is a dialectical analysis is how you go about looking at a thing, whether it's a concept, whether it's an event, whatever, and you start going, how is it at odds with itself? And that is, how does it fail to be itself? And what the trick is, the very failure to be itself, that's where Zizek comes in and goes, that retroactively is its identity. Like the, the way it's not living up or fully embodying itself, that is what gives it the, its identity. So that's what I'll say about it. Yeah, Mikey, that's great. I think that what you just said is great. I think that's better than anything I ever said. But I would say that um, I, 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 I totally agree that sense certainty should be the model for the model chapter from the phenomenology that people look at and not the master servant dialectic, because that's so misleading for the reason you say, right? Like you can say, oh, it's this opposition. Oh, yeah. And it's not. But, but if you read it carefully, what's interesting, I think, is that each he discusses the internal failure of mastery on its own terms and the internal failure of servitude on its own terms. So he doesn't he doesn't buy it, but it's misleading because I think people don't read it that way. They read it like, oh, there are these two opposed positions that are at war with each other, and then they, they and then we get to this this compromise position, which is stoicism, right? Which is kind of half mastery and half servitude. But, but, but that's wrong. And that's not that. And, and I would say, in light of what you said, the other thing is that there, 
one of the things Hegel's showing in, in the phenomenology is there's never been a master. There's never been a servant. There's never been a sense certaintist. There's even never been a stoic or a skeptic. And I said this very thing in a, in a talk to a bunch of Hege- like analytic philosophy Hegelians, and they were they were not having it. But I, I just was like, look, sorry, like that's that's what he's sh- because he's showing exactly what you're saying. Like you 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 trace. I like this ideal ego. Each position has its ideal ego, and then Hegel says, what does it do? Like, what's it do when you put this in action? What's it do? And what happens is it never lives up to what it thinks it is, right? And so it's really a philosophy, too. I mean, I think it's interesting that Marx gets credit for being this philosophy of action. But Hegel's really saying, what's the act associated with the position? And then that's how we know the truth of the position, right? Like, sense certainty is a lie because we know when we try to practice it, it fails. And that's true of all the positions he he looks at. And and my thing is, like... Look, somebody could take this out of context and they could take it in wild ways, but you'll know what I mean. I'm so I'm going to say it to you. Basically, every every mode of consciousness in phenomenology of spirit has its ideal ego and its death drive. And by de- I don't mean the way that you and I as human beings get into it, but I mean it if you push it if you, if you inspect it up, you start to see there's some hard kernel of alterity that's undermining its ability to be yeah. its ideal ego and that dialectical undermining of itself, metaphorically, we could call death drive. Yeah, no, it's great. I love yeah. that. Yeah. So and so, write that. You so, write a book uh, on that. Whatever. <laughs> uh, but uh, no, and you know, the, but the thing also, it, it's important with like the master slave dialectic. And this also clicked for me not too long ago. I'm like, look, you're right. It's, and I'm so glad you said that, where it's like, that's the moment where you think the dialectic is about these two opposites that are yeah. substantial opposites outside of themselves. Oh, yeah, they there's a kind of relationality that gives them their identity, but you're still viewing them as independent subjects, right? And so, but the trick is, it's at this point where both of them are self-consciousness. Self-consciousness splits between the two of them, right. and they're two embodiments of self-consciousness. And what he does is he shows that one dead ends. And this other, the one mode of self-consciousness deads in, that's the master. And the other mode of self-consciousness keeps going dialectically. And that's the slave. Right. Right. But both right. are self-consciousness. I mean, right. But it is true. Like, it, 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 if, you, if the critique is there are no pure negations in Hegel, that section shows that that's wrong. Because yeah, it dead ends. Right. And, and Kojev, Alexander Kojev, the great Hegel scholar of the early 20th century, has this, he, he says, ma- mastery is an existential impasse. It's, a, it's like a perfect line about, he, he doesn't get much right about Hegel, but that is totally right, I think. It's exactly right. Yeah. Okay. Let me ask you, yeah. Todd, can you look at the chat? I want to send a quote and I want you to be able to read along. Sure. Okay. Let me put sure. it in the chat here. I got it. So I'm going to read it for everybody. This is a land quote. It's not too long, but let me read it. And then I kind of want to go over it with you, Todd. So there is, I love this way he does start this quote. He says, the noumenon is the absence of the subject. I think that's a good way to talk about this concept, right? Mm-hmm. It's, and it kind of gets to the heart of it. Wherever the noumenon is, the subject is not, right? <clears throat> and he says, and is, uh, and is thus inaccessible in principle to experience. This is the straight up Kantian concept of the noumenon. <clears throat> okay. If there is still a so called noumenal subject in the opening phase of the critical enterprise, it is only because of a residue of theological reasoning, uh, because a re- residue of theological reasoning conceives a stratum of the self which is invulnerable to transition or synonymous with time as such. This is the real or deep subject. The self or soul, a subject that sloths off its empirical instantiation without impairment and the immortal subject of morality. Now, let's. Mortality. Uh, mortality, right. Immortality. Uh, okay. Let's stop there and then we'll read the rest in a second. So you're better qualified to say, it, but look, Kant basically has to hold on to some postulate of the soul of the enduring deep subject as or or the noumenal subject and not for not in the critique of pure reason but in the critique of practical reason correct because he has to have well, a, a postulate of morality like yeah i guess but 
Yeah, it's certainly not in the first critique. But even in the second critique, the, the justification for that isn't a, the, like Land is making it seem like this is a, there's a theoretical justification. All, all Kant says is <laughs> there has to be, so he thinks, that, so for Kant, the, the, the moral law is, and this is developed in the second critique, is what he calls the fact of reason, right? So it is, it is the unavoidable fact of reason for every subject. But that, and, and, then, and then he, he says, so that lets us know that we are practically free for Kant. So it, it, in that way, the second critique seems to violate the first critique, because the first critique comes to uh, antinomy when it comes to the question of freedom and necessity and can't decide between the two. But Kant says, no, I'm not refuting anything. All I'm saying is practically we, we are free. But theoretically, we're governed by necessity. So, what di- what Land is doing is he's not recognizing, and then and then sorry, and then and then he goes on to say, okay, we can act, we can act, we act morally, we follow the moral law, but we can never fully follow the moral law as, lo- as long as we're empirical, lacking subjects, right? So, how, that, and he's like, that just seems that's too horrible to contemplate because. How can that be? We we live our lives to always having this ideal that we fail to, to live up to. So we have to posit, he thinks, an immortal soul as a way to like work out this striving for the moral law that we can never do in the mortal well we, before we've slept off this mortal coil. Oh, so so the idea is that uh, the, the the this idea of a a, a soul that's immortal only has a practical justification. See, like it's not, there's no theoretical justification for it in Kant. It's just in order to, in order to, in order to have to understand the moral law and to understand, to make it make sense to us, we have to posit this, this immortality well, maybe, maybe, of the soul. Look, if I sh- try to strongman his argument. I think what he would say is, okay, it is a moral or ethical postulate, but when we think about what the immortal soul would be for Kant, it would be a noumenal deep subject beyond our transcend or our empirical psychological. Correct. Self. Except except I think isn't what's interesting about this quotation is that he he elides the most important part of the of the Kantian right, what subject. Is it? Well which is the transcendental, right? Like like it's not the trend, like, like he's trying to make it when he says noumenal, he's trying to make it transcendent, right? He's trying to say, okay, Kant has this empirical subject, sure. And then he has this transcendent noumenal subject. But the the important subject for Kant is neither one nor the other. It's it's caught between. And even the moral subject is caught between. Like it's neither phenomenal nor noumenal, it's on the level of the transcendental, which is not transcendent. But the transcendental means it's what the, the, the transcendental gives the rules that govern experience. But it's not just empirical, and it's not totally removed from experience either. So I think that he he's kind of eliding that key way to think of Kantian subjectivity, in my view. That's what I would say. Hello, beautiful listener. I I see you. Just kidding. I don't, I, I can't, but I have to interrupt this just really quick to make my own advertisement, my very own, the one that says subscribing, liking, commenting, it actually makes a really big difference. So even if you're just on the free side, shout out to you. Thanks for doing it. Make sure to subscribe and all that, especially people on the podcast, make sure to say something nice in the reviews. It actually really helps. And, uh, I need reviews on every platform. All right. Because it, 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 I, <laughs> I just hate to say it. It matters. You know, I try not to chase the almighty algorithm, but also I don't want to have all of this beautiful content go to waste. And so I'm trying to walk a fine line between quality and quantity. And I come out way heavier on the side of quality, as you can obviously see we do here. But come on, let's, uh, let's, let's push that subscribe button. You know, let's smash that like button, you know, like, uh, teach the algorithm what you actually care about, all right? And then maybe it'll show it to other people. That's great. All right, let's get back to it. So this is going to get more interesting. And for anybody who's wondering, this quote that we're analyzing from Land, it's from 
the thirst for annihilation, the section called Fang Numenon, which is maybe the only place that Land himself ever used that term. Uh, and it's on page 110. So, okay. So he, but he does. Land thinks that Kant posits this numinal subject. Um, and then he goes on to say, he brings Hegel into it. And this is where I, I, I get confused. He says, it only remains for Hegel to rigorously identify this subject with death, with the death necessitated by the allergy of Geist to its finitude to attain a conception of death for itself. But this is all still the absence of the subject, even when of is translated into the subjective genitive, and at zero, none of it makes any difference. So I, part of me is like, okay, so somehow, let's read again. It only remains for Hegel to rigorously identify this deep noumenal subject uh, with death, with the death necessitated by the allergy of Geist to its finitude, to attain a conception of death for itself. As a Hegelian, does that make sense to you? That doesn't make any sense at all to me. I have to be I, honest. I, I just don't know what he's saying. I don't know what he's saying. I, 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 for one, I mean, all these were, I mean, there are words. I understand the words, but... <laughs> But uh, oh, I don't have some on my teeth. Uh, I just don't. I don't understand what the, they're because, like, I'm not sure there's an allergy of Geist to its finitude. That doesn't make sense to me. Um, what the way death comes in in the in the preface of the phenomenology is as like death comes through the subject's finitude, right? Like, and and through the act of the understanding that the the way. The way that the understanding for Hegel divides the world up is that negation is death for Hegel. Negation is death, right? Like, like he even says, death, if that, you remember that line in the preface where he says, death, if that's what we want to call it, right? He's talking about negation, negation, negation. He goes, death, if that's what we want to call it, right? So mm -hmm. he's all, he, the, 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 there's constant tearing with death in Hegel. Like, there's, con like, and that's the, Again, that's the, the way in which the servant shows its existential superiority to the master who doesn't, the master's like, you know what? I want recognition. I don't care if I die. The servant's like, that's dumb because if you're dead, recognition is worthless. And that for Hague, this absolute dread in the face of death is, a, is the, is the like, great insight of the servant relative to the master. So that doesn't make any sense to me. I don't see an allergy. Can I get, okay. to its been, yeah, Here's what I was thinking. Tell me what you think of this. Okay. Maybe he's okay. doing this move. And, okay, so if there's ways I've heard of Jewish philosophers talk about this, where they kind of think that immortality is not this thing like you go to off into heaven, but you live forever because the, the, the effects of your actions in the world trickle on forever. And there's a mm -hmm. way that you're immortal in this kind of causal chain that lives on. And what I'm wondering is if he says like this deep noumenal subject, which he, Hegel's going to identify with spirit. The thing is, if we are spirit, well, yes, we as individuals die, but spirit just keeps living on forever as this collective intelligibility of humanity. And if you identify if you identify spirit as this collective intelligibility of humanity uh, with immortality, then it's the noumenal subject because, and on top of it, now you, at least from land, you've dialectically negated death itself because there is no real death in this meaningful right. sense because spirit okay. doesn't die. Is that maybe? Yeah, should... maybe that's what he's saying. I, I think that's a terrible reading of Hegel, but that's probably what I think you're, that's giving him a lot of credit. I think that's right. I mean, I, I, it's interesting, right? Because the heat death of the universe would really do put a put a crimp in that sense of immortality. Well, and, but he, Land would champion that. He would say, "This is Hegel not being able to reckon." Yeah, yeah. No, I understand. That, I understand. that death is going to get. But I guess yeah. maybe that's the thing. Like the uh, okay, where is he said again? Uh, rigorously, the the death. So the death necessitated by the like. Okay, 
if you subsume death in the spirit as the the immortal subject, the noumenal subject that endures all, even though we as individuals die, yeah. right? You've gotten rid of the finitude of spirit. It's a aller allergy to its finitude because it's basically indefinitely going to continue to exist. And so right. maybe that's the finitude, like spirit doesn't want to deal with the fact, like you're saying of the heat death, where it would just be the total annihilation of all collective human intelligibility gathered across history, that that would be what it would be for spirit to die. And, and spirit is allergic yeah. to that. Yeah, it's, I wonder, it's an interesting question because that was discovered, you know, 30 some years after Hegel died. Interestingly, though, Marx was alive and he thought it was a bourgeois plot. He, he, he really hated the idea. Like, he, really? so, yeah, so it is interesting. It's a, it's a fascinating, like, what would Hegel have thought? And I, I think it, I think it would have been, I think it would have caused him some trouble because for the same reason that I think he doesn't really do a great job of explaining um, despite what you said about death drive, which I really like, by the way, I think, I think what it would also, I think Trump would give him some trouble. Like, I think these absolute, like, reactionary movements, Nazism, whatever, like, I think they would give him some trouble. Like, I think it was a hard, it's, it would be hard for him to think about them as a philosopher of history. I think as a dialectical thinker, it's not hard for him to think about that. But I think if you think Hegel has a theory of history, which I'm not sure that he does because he didn't write the book on that, he just gave lectures on it, uh, then then I think that's an issue. So, but I think I think if you think about what we were saying earlier about the phenomenology and the absolute, then I don't think the heat death of the universe is such a big issue. Like that, like that's that's the that like that's the limit of spirit finally, right? Like spirit knows its limit. That's it. Look, and, and, uh, I want to, okay. So I want to read two quotes of Hegel and then we'll move on to Schelling. But what I, okay. I guess the, the Hegelian thing is I wonder if Hegel, if Hegel was around and we could get him to read Freud and Lacan, I wonder if Hegel would look at thinkers like Land, like Heidegger, as you're saying with death, like Levinas with the other, uh, and say to him, why do you need this radical alterity? Like, it's almost like a question. Like, I, I, I just wonder what if Hegel would be like, why do you need this so much? Like, why is this so? Right. I mean, like, I think what he would say is like, sorry, you're mystical. Right. And I think if there's nothing, he is more against than mysticism, because because what does it do? I mean, like, it's it, it reminds me of what, you know, I ha this is too unfair to these thinkers, but it a little doesn't it a little bit remind you of like the 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 the, the sort of uh, chauvinist sexist guy who's like oh i respect women so much they're so much better than us whatever right like when you when i they're hear so that, above I'm and like, be above and beyond they're just above they're just you know when i hear that you know i like release the catch of my browning because it's like a <laughs> it's like a uh, uh, it's such, it's like more, far worse than just the bald sexism, right? Because it seems like respect, but it's the opposite of respect because it posits this absolute other and doesn't see the way in which women are just as contradictory as men are, right? It's like, there's no, there's not one that's a solution and one's not, right? Like, so I think that that anytime you do that, I mean, that, I think there's a lot of, I know a lot of, not that I know a lot of anti-Semites, but I've, I've met a few people that don't know they're anti-Semitic and one of they do this about Jews, you know, like they're like, they have this kind of whatever relationship to whatever, you know, like they're like, why are Jews the, like uh, such a large majority of Nobel prize winners, right? Like they have this kind of like, they'll say things like that. And you're like, wait a minute, why are you like already there's, you're like positing some kind of, even though it's a, it's a compliment, but there's a, there's a way in which that's just the reverse side of like, the show off, right? So mm -hmm. I think, I think that's a that seems to me what he would say, right? He'd okay. say like, why do you need this mystical other? And like, because isn't the, everything he does in his philosophy is to destroy that? Because he says, you know what? You think this thing is out there beyond contradiction? Let's take a look. Let's look at what it does, and we'll mm -hmm. see that it it's just as contra. But and, and I mean, that's what that's what that you know that line he repeats in the preface over and over substance substance is subject that's what it means they'd want to treat that other as substantial and hegel was going to say sorry it's it's a subject just like you and me 
Like that's what he's saying about God. So he's certainly going to say that about whatever. whatever fields the, of intensity the, or... Yeah, fields of intensity or or like the face of the other for Levinas or or the... or. The, or Zine with a with a Y for Heidegger, right? Like I've been reading the Black Notebook, but it's like, how many more times can I read Zine with a Y? Just <laughs> spell it the right way. I mean, it's just so it's like forgetting of Zine, forgetting of okay, yeah, we forgot. Like it's terrible. I just, you know, I long you're reading along, you're like longing for like a nice phrase of 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 Nazism and some anti-Semitic stuff to get out of this forgetting of being all the time. And so it's really, it's, it's, it's just maddening. But I think that's exactly, that's, to me, that's like, again, the er text of all these other ones, right? Like yeah. it's just doing this kind of like positing this pure thing that's untouched. Like it's not even spelled right. It's not touched by our spelling. It's so pure. Yeah. Right. Okay. So, um, all right. Yeah. Before we move to Schelling, I want to look at these two quotes from Hegel. Um, this is on. I'm using Terry Pinker's uh, translation here. This is. On I think page. that's the one to use. Now. I, I, I prefer, really like it. I think it's OK. I think it's good. And, and it's going to become the standard. But I really like the Michael Inwood one best. So. Do you really? OK. Yeah. If I was going to next time I teach it, I'm going to teach the Inwood. Yeah. Oh, shit. OK. Yeah. Uh, but, it, but I don't know. I mean, Pinkert's everybody at this Hegel thing used the Pinkert. So but only, they, we're going to look at the quote. Like, I, I just I, I have trouble letting before, them off the hook for tarrying, mistranslating tarrying. Yeah. Could we, uh, okay. could we just say like a couple more things about that? Because then I take it that this is not the translation. This one right here. This. No, that's fine. I think actually, I don't think it's bad. I, 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 the Miller. I, 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 yeah, the Miller is fine. I did a, and it's cheaper, so that's a good that's a good reason to have it. Uh, I I did a little. Uh, I'm not trying to pimp it, but I did a little video on Hegel translations, and I think that the, the long and the short of it was, I'll just sum it up so you don't have to watch it. Um, I think they're all good. There's like six, and I think even the earliest one, the J.B. Bailey one, it's it's translated as phenomenology of mind, so it's like okay, maybe that's not great, but. There's warrant for that. It's and it's 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 fine actually. And there are ways in which it's better. So I think they're all. Each of them have their own. The only one I don't. I, I hate to say this because translation sucks, and it, I don't want to uh, attack anyone. But there, there there's this. Uh, I forget their name. It's published by Notre Dame. It's Evans and somebody. Uh, it's it's maybe not the greatest, but um, but the Pinkard I think has a lot of merit i think the inwood has a lot of merit and i think the miller is fine so yeah so don't don't sell it okay <laughs> thank yeah. you okay hold on let me i'm copy it won't let me put the whole quote because it's a this is a little bit long but this one is one of the most famous quotes in phenomenology of spirit and it's completely relevant to what we're talking about hold on All right, one more, hold on. This will be our- oh, Good, you're not point. quoting a thing that I miss. I actually kind of got that right, didn't I? More or less. Yeah, <laughs> okay, <that>. so <laughs> these two, the two, I, I wanna look at the big quote, famous quote, but all right, so the first one, uh, it, it, Hegel says, whatever is limited to a natural life is not on its own, capable of going beyond its immediate existence, but it is driven out beyond its immediate existence by an other, and this being torn out of itself, uh, or, and this being torn out of itself is its death. So could you kind of reiterate like what he's, the point he's making there? Yeah. So he's just saying that things are contradictory and they are destroyed not by themselves, but by death, and that's what, and they're, and that's how their contradiction manifest, their contradictoriness manifests itself, and what, and that's what, that's that applies to all other entities except us, right? And he thinks that the privilege of subjectivity, if you could call it that, is that it destroys itself, right? So there's a kind of death drive already lingering sort of there, in the background, right? yeah, in the background, right? Because this, like. 
we aren't what this apply when you're talking about natural life here he's not talking about us uh so death doesn't destroy us from without it destroys us from within like we we are the and so in this one sense he's completely against spinoza right so he says spinoza says like no thing dies of its own uh, uh its own momentum its own volition but hegel thinks like that's what subjectivity is like we destroy ourselves like we are responsible and and he thought that suicide was in a certain sense the greatest act of the or the proof of subjectivity right that we're right. the entity that kills ourselves so in the quote where he says natural life because i'm trying to not read in my immediate natural life to mean means biological organisms but would that include yes. for him That's right. rocks and planets and well ultimately yes yeah so he thinks like a rock or a planet let's say ultimately is destroyed it dies it doesn't it's uh, its integrity doesn't hold up right like it and it's just destroyed from the outside like all things like rocks erode away right by water wind whatever uh planets blow up because whatever the sun goes nova right so yeah so that's so yeah it means, so, so it's it a means, broader sense of death it's not just yeah. biological life right right in existence or yeah. neg negation of i mean here he might be talking specifically about the biological but but that idea applies to everything right okay okay so then i want to read just the the famous quote here um we've got it in sections so i'll read a section and then we'll talk and then we'll keep going okay so hegel says and this one is uh, in the pinker from pages 20 to 21. he says as it used to be carried out the analysis of a representation was indeed nothing but the sublation of the form of its familiarity to break up a representation into its original elements is to return to its moments which at least do not have the form of a representation which one has simply stumbled across but which instead constitute the immediate possession of the self. To be sure, the analysis would only arrive at thoughts which are themselves familiar and fixed, or it would arrive at motionless determinations. However, what is separated, the non-actual itself, is itself an essential moment, for the concrete is self-moving only because it divides itself and turns itself into the non-actual. Todd, could you give us a Yeah, comment? so, yeah, so, I know, he's not, <laughs> uh, he could be clearer. Uh, so here, what he's saying is that, and this is, he's talking about the, un, the, the act of understanding here and what it does, that, that things, that they can only, they are only understood, they only become what they are through this, dividing of themselves and becoming what they're not right and and i think um the concrete is self-moving it even like even if you you can even think about this in terms of like our everyday movements right like we we're at a certain we're in a certain position and then we move in some way so we become what we're not and that like we move into a space we weren't in we drink some i mean this is he uses the example of eating an apple like we 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 drink something and then this water, which isn't me, becomes part of me at some point, right? And so there's this this kind of this act of of this relationship between what is what is me and what's not me that's constantly manifesting itself. And that's what he's talking about here. That there's if a thing isn't divided, it isn't. Right? Like it like it's division it's self divisions are what allow it to move around and its face and even allow it to be right like allow it to interact i think one the best maybe the best way to think about this is its self divisions allow it to interact with what's outside of it and this is true i think for us and it's true for if we could like the thing that seems to interact the least is the rock right but it's nonetheless interacting right water's coming over and taking part of it away but with us we're constantly interacting with what we're not right we spend our whole that's what we do that's what it, and and so this this like vent what he calls venturing into the non-actual like that's that's what we're constantly venturing into non-actual and making it actual and so that's for him that's what he's trying to say here okay okay and so he goes on 
says, the activity of separating is the force and labor of the understanding, the most astonishing and the greatest of all powers, or rather, which is the absolute power. The circle, which enclosed within itself, is at rest and which, as substance, sustains its moments, is the immediate and is, for that reason, an unsurpassing, unsurprising relationship. However, the accidental, separated from its surroundings, attains an isolated freedom and its own proper existence only in its being bound to other actualities and only as existing in their context. As such, it is the tremendous power of the negative. It is the energy of thinking of the pure eye. Yeah. So what this is meant, I, I, to me, this is one of the most important uh, paragraphs in Hegel's work, all of his work. And what he's saying here, and then the next one too, what he's saying here is that he identifies our, the power of subjectivity, not with, so it's interesting because you read this first and you're like, wait a minute, he's praising the understanding when in a way the whole book is a critique of the understanding, that he associates Kant with the understanding and the understanding divides things up and reason shows the dialectical connection. So why, maybe he just made a mistake and meant to say reason here and he said understanding, but that no, he didn't because what he thinks is first the understanding breaks apart and then reason shows the connection between what's been broken apart. And the breaking apart is essential because if you don't have the breaking apart, you have this, that's what he's saying when he says, the circle enclosed on itself is at rest. And so if you don't have this breaking apart of the act of the understanding, then you just get all, it's just, you get Spinoza. Everything is one and you don't get a dynamic structure. And that, so, so the act of the understanding splitting things off from each other which is what subjectivity does. It looks out in the world and says, because there's no, like, why should it be? I'm looking out my, 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 my window. I see gr like a whole field of grass, right? And then I see trees. I see trees. Like, why should I separate the trees from the blades of grass? But that's what the understanding does, right? It separates them. And in that act, it creates a negation, right? It negates, it shows, it puts them in, makes them different from each other it negates the one through the other and that hegel thinks is the way that we that's what the eye does and it introduces i'm going to skip to the next thing i had a little head time introduces death into into life like this kind of or not death into life but it introduces death into this otherwise just purely self-identical seemingly self-identical structure because it's only in viewing things as separate that you can go, that thing died or ceased to exist. Right, right. Like, cause it, cause if, if like the mouse was just part of this whole, of all nature, this is true for Spinoza. Like he doesn't think there's not really death because it's all just part of this thing. And so there's okay. Individuals die, but it's all part of the nature just kind of lives on. Right. Energy and so can be neither created or destroyed. Destroyed. So, there you go. That. Yeah. Yeah, there you go. So, so that, and so this is why this is Hegel's move past Spinoza. And he's saying it's only when you make that division that death gets introduced and it sucks. It sucks. Like then you're like, people die. And, and it's funny because, right, Spinoza is the one who famously said in a letter that all determination is negation. And you would say, well, yeah, and that implies death. Right, right. And then, and he also says this great line from the ethics, right? He says, uh, 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 that the 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 death the 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 philosopher thinks of death least of all things. His his philosophy is a meditation on life, not on death. Right. So that's Spinoza, and Hegel would reverse that in a way. He'd say no, because tearing with the negative really is tearing with death. Right. So he would say no. The philosopher is constantly tearing with the negative. You're constantly thinking the things that you don't want to have to think. Right. You don't want to have to. You wish you didn't. You think to yourself, like, I wish I didn't have to think. That. Question about to have. Yeah. Right. Like I, I my, my hey, Dave, uh, hold on. Dave, can you mute? Dave. Can you, you can mute? hear me? Yeah. You're, they can yeah. hear me. Anne is all like just checking to see What's if up, I'm Anne? on stream. You couldn't hear her, could you? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, OK. Well, 
There you go. <laughs> so, uh, she was joking, but, um, yeah. So we're about to switch over to the second question here. I was just letting her know we've got, got off the stream basically still for the segment. So, um, are we closing out on shelling right now? Or sorry, well, Hagel, well, and getting well, into Hagel, shelling? No, or? A little bit more on Hegel. Just a, we're almost done. Okay. Um, okay, but Todd, I also think maybe one of the things when I was studying Heidegger all those years was he just totally ignores Spinoza, and that quote makes me wonder, like well, maybe that's why he ignored him. Is yeah, 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 yeah. You know, like yeah. how dare you yeah. say a philosopher doesn't think about death, right? Right. right. Um, right. Okay, so let's finish this quote. So uh, Hegel says, "Death." If that is what we wish to call that non-actuality is the most fearful thing of all. And to keep and hold fast to what is dead requires only the greatest force. Powerless beauty detests the the understanding because the understanding expects of her what she cannot do. However, the life of spirit is not a life that is fearing death and austerely saving itself from ruin rather it bears death calmly and in death it sustains itself spirit only wins its truth by finding its feet in its absolute disruption spirit is not this power which as the positive avoids looking at the negative and is the case when we say of something that it is nothing or that it is false and then being done with it go off on our own way onto something else else no spirit is this power only by looking the negative in the face and lingering with it this lingering tearing is the magical power that converts it into being see that's where i think land would say that's where spirit is swallowing death and like it's integrating right. it in the radical alterity right. into itself Right. But, but it's, I mean, again, I still have the objection about the absolute, which we started with, but yeah, yeah. I would just say he's not integrating it. It's like making it its principle, right? The, in a certain, like, it's not, spirit isn't the conquest of death. It's like the, how do you, like, it's the constant tarrying with it. I mean, what, what more could you ask? I mean, that's why I think he causes, Hegel causes such a problem for Heidegger, right? Like, because Heidegger wants this this philosophy of Sein zum Tod of, of being toward death, and and Hegel already kind of has it, and so he should be much more allied with it. But he can't. You know, there are all these other kinds of differences between them, and so I think he can't. He ends up having to really distance himself from Hegel in a way that, to me, never really made sense. If you take this as really Hegel's fundamental statement, and if you take Heidegger's discussions of death from being in time is what's fundamental to his philosophy. Then I think there's a there's a kind of a kinship between them about this question that is unthought really by either, but I mean, obviously not by Hegel, but by Hegelian. Like it, it, it's true of me. I mean, I'm guilty of this too uh, because they're so different on other in so many ways that I, I when I first read them, this is what I was drawn to this this connection, but. You know, no one else thinks about this. Like everybody, all the people that are into Hegel have to oppose him to Heidegger for other reasons. And then this, I think this connection gets lost. So. Okay. I want to okay, ask really quick if you've, um, do you remember us bringing up Brent Adkins, the Deleuzian who we had on, on Deleuze's oh, yeah, yeah. birthday? Yeah. 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 I just, it was already kind of like you know, a, a distant goal to maybe someday get the two of you to talk. But I just wanted to say, he wrote a book called Death and Desire in Hegel, Heidegger, and Deleuze. Oh, and, yeah, I've read that book. Oh, yeah. okay. And so he sees yeah. Deleuze as like this great take on death that's not in Heidegger or Hegel. And I was wondering, do, so if you did read it, then does he see Hegel and Heidegger's uh, theories of death very differently from how you've articulated it here? I don't, I, I don't really remember it so well just because I really objected to the <laughs> idea of the love having that position. Um, so I don't know. I can't say. So. Cool. Okay. Okay. okay we we want to switch over to shelling Dave. Real yeah. Quick. Yeah, I think so. Um, anything you want to say here, Nance, anything pile up from this first round? 
and then we'll 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 segue over. I mean, uh, outside of the three pages of of notes I have going on here, <laughs> um, <laughs> I do okay. So so this idea of um, the the limit being where we can encounter this radical alterity, I think that's um, <laughs> radical. Um, coming from like the, I guess what little history and background I've, I've managed to get. Um, and yeah, I guess maybe it does make, um, some of these post Heideggerians feel a little, uh, flaccid or, or limp as far as like making this radical alterity be their fetish object almost like it's it's like yeah. um but yeah i i don't know man this is great this is fucking amazing let's keep it no, going no, no. i think nance i think i really like what you're saying about that because i think that it i think that, that a certain way of reading hegel had to predominate because if you read him this other way then it would call into question like precisely this, I don't know what you want to call it, like fe like fetishism is a good word, but like mysticism or whatever about the absolute, about the absolute other or about absolute alterity or about, you know, being whatever it is, right? So I think that that, I think that that, I think that's right. What you're saying is really good that I, I think that, that assert that, that it's, it, it's not that, I think this is what I would say. It's not that first there was a misreading of Hegel and then there was this position of, you know, uh, fetishization of absolute alterity. It's, I think it happened the other way around. Like, first there's this fetishization of absolute alterity, and then that demanded a certain reading of Hegel that fit into that, so. And I, I, I guess, if, I, I'm just curious about how you um, are thinking about Levinas's alterity, because obviously he's one of these thinkers who's a thinker of the other. And yep. I'm, I'm like... Right now on, you know, teaching totality and infinity, one of my big questions is like, it seems like for him, there is this, this kind of alterity that, but by the way, everyone, that word just means otherness, right? This kind of otherness that is the, the anonymous wrestling of the there is, it's like this, it's the thing that terrifies a baby at night, you know, uh, it's the thing mm -hmm. that you, you brush up against with insomnia and with, uh, that other existentialist word that I always forget, nausea. Well, um, in uh, but then he also thinks about like the uppercase O other and the other and 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 that this is that this is like the human, like the radical, the human that cannot be uh, functionalized, instrumentalized. Like it is, it's the soft, gooey human stuff that escapes the the machine. And it and I'm and I'm I'm kind of like it's like the absolutely other is supposed to be like the human other, but it's also, but then there's also this other other, this, this infinite expanse of the, there is. And so I'm just curious um, if that's something you've thought about much and if you've brought it into relation with Hegel or if that's just something I'm going to have to go look into on my own. Well, no, I think it, it, Dave, that's a fascinating, like that difference is so important for phenomenology, right? Like, because it's, it's the difference between, I mean, like so when Heidegger I think that that you know Levinas was Heidegger's second at the Davos disputation I'm sure he right. knows this. um uh but, so he was very influenced by Heidegger right? right so uh I think that 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 other that's sort of lurking in the background that is like what you know um I was listening to a Heideggerian talk about this and he's like what being is for Heidegger is is das ohne was so that means like that without what, right? Like it's it's like that it is, not before what it is, right? And so I think that's what that when that thing lurking in the background is just that things are that it is, right? Mm -hmm. And not what it, like what it is is already an attempt to kind of contain that, just that it is. I mean, Sartre's way of expressing this is that existence comes before essence, right? And Heidegger didn't really like that so much, but. Uh, I think he, I think basically they're saying the same thing. Uh, and Heidegger just didn't like the fact that Sartre was a leftist and he wasn't. Uh, but I think that that, I think that that's what in the background of what Levinas is. 
doing. But I think what's interesting is that he's much more concerned with the ethical relation before that relationship to this whatness or this thatness of things, right? Like, I think he, 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 I mean, that's what this, this like ethics precedes ontology or Levinas is, I think, really, I think, crucial to his philosophy. That is, like, before we, we have this ethical relationship to the other, the other, the face of the other, before we have a relationship to things even, like to, or to, to being, right? So it's in, in that way, I think he is different from Heidegger, from Sard, and from, and it, 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 I, the, the one text that it would be interesting for you to even do a class on is uh, Husserl's Cartesian Meditations, because mm-hmm. in the meditations, he distinguishes, I mean, you probably notice, he distinguishes between these two kinds of relations that it's only, but for Husserl, and I think Levinas is critical of him. For his Levinas' book on Husserl is the best book that anyone ever wrote on Husserl, I think. Um, but but uh, uh, he distinct the, the Husserl he for Husserl the way our relation to things comes first, and then our relationship to the other. And Levinas is reversing that. So that's all. I mean, I I I I, I think that he's not. I think he's different than Husserl and Heidegger. But I think it's still the same idea of this absolute otherness, absolute alterity that we have to try to deal with that Hegel is thinking in a different way, right? Hegel is thinking, okay, you encounter the absolute alterity through dialectics, not prior to dialectics. And that is, I think, the this will lead nicely into the Schelling discussion, I think, because that is everything. And that's why I think phenomenology is ultimately a uh, go back to the beginning, phenomenology, not phenomenology of spirit, phenomenology like Husserl, Heidegger, Levinas. It's ultimately a back to the beginning. Let's get back to the originary. And Hegel's like, as Mikey was saying, let's work through what is being done and let's see what results from it. So it's a, it's like for Hegel, the emphasis on where you end up. For, for phenomenologists, it's where you start, I think. So that, that to me, I mean, that's very simplified, but I think in simple ways, so I, I that that's how it makes sense to me. I think that's good. I like that. Perfect. Thank you so much. We cannot do direct revolution, but the only way to lay the foundation for it is to do what you are doing to move the underground. It's a theoretically correct title. Welcome to Theory Underground, a place for workers with earbuds who are tired of letting others read and think on their behalf, slipstreaming our way into an understanding of the situation that short circuits the deadlocks of our moment. Research at Theory Underground focuses on what is most important for understanding our current situation. Theory of the subject, capital, time energy theory, critical media theory, CMT, and the most essential critiques necessary for understanding why the theory, ideology, and common sense of influencers left to right misses the mark. Theory Underground is coming to a city near you. What that has meant in the last year is traveling across the United States, into Canada, and then all over Europe to promote our books, courses, and ideas related to time energy and underground theory. You've been reading Underground Theory. I'm a publisher and an editor. I run a review of books. Literally, it's my living. This is the best edited collection I've ever read. Okay, picture the scene. America, early 2021. An Amazon warehouse worker arises from the emerging underground theory internet scene to create spaces for untimely topics and concerns that are too often neglected or kept in isolation today. Joined by a revolving cast of underground theorists, academics and critics, he establishes what will become Theory Underground, a teaching, research and publishing platform by and for working class intellectuals, autodidacts and academics who want to do more than they're able to do within the confines of academia. That warehouse worker's name is David McCarricker and his book Time Energy is his first major contribution to the world of theory. It was recently reprinted with a foreword by none other than Slavoj Žižek, who also contributed to Theory Underground's latest book. Uh, uh, uh. My Bible, it's an excellent book. A collection of essays called Underground Theory. 
What you just heard is an excerpt from the Strange Exiles podcast, episode 23, where Bram from Strange Exiles interviewed me and Mikey. For those who don't know, Mikey is the author of the Dangerous Maybe blog. We are publishing one of his books here shortly at Theory Underground. He's also a lecturer at Theory Underground. And he's someone I've been friends and a collaborator with for over 10 years. But most importantly for you all, he's a fantastic lecturer and it's a crime that he has to do wage labor right now. One of the long term goals of Theory Underground has been now for a couple of years to hashtag free Mikey. That is something that I've been really pushing. But first I had to get freed from wage labor, which was achieved this year. That's right. Thanks to my monthly seminar subscribers, I was able to quit amazon and do theory underground full time now i'm announcing the next big phase of the plan which is the mikey down seminar what monthly subscribers to the mikey seminar are paying for is a survey of philosophy including deep dives into zizek land lacan baudrillard bataille leotard and ultimately the whole history of philosophy we're trying to build like this ongoing seminar right and that that's what i really like about this thing where, you know, if I'm teaching a main text, that's something I gotta focus on, I gotta really, but the seminar thing, we can do this stuff all the time where we dive deeper into concepts, we dive deeper into certain, you know, sections of books or whatever, and we can really do this nuanced stuff. I think that there's probably no better way for us to accelerate our learning in these areas than by slipstreaming Mikey and, that has been my belief for years and years and years now. It's official. You're able to help out. You're able to get involved. You're able to benefit directly from liberating him from wage labor. Get on it right now. Do it. D just go. Stop what you're doing. Go click the button. Subscribe. That's, that's what you do. Subscribe to him. If you're already signed up for the ongoing Theory Underground seminars, then that's the ones that I do with my wife, Anne. Though that's getting an upgrade, which means that I will be doing one session per month that is just me. And then I will also be doing the ones with Anne, which are a crash course in sociology, anthropology, the social sciences, and ultimately Marx, Heidegger, Levinas, Bourdieu, imminently critiquing pop psychology, sociology, self-help, and ultimately the doxa of our time. But if you would like to be a subscriber to both Mikey's seminar and the seminar that the Snellgrove McCarrickers are doing, then the best way is to become a tier four subscriber, or you can be a tier two subscriber to each of us. The reason this matters is because tier two is like pretty much the best bang for your buck. It gives you huge discounts on all of the courses that we do. But uh, if you can't afford it, tier four is amazing because it gives you tier three access at both Mikey's seminar and ours. And finally, not everybody has time to be part of these ongoing research seminars, and they just want to fund the paid content for the YouTube and podcast. And so thank you so, so much to our patrons over at Patreon. They're the ones funding all the free stuff. So big thank you to Bert, Marilyn, Carl, Heel, Zozandra, Nikolai, Darian, Tyler, and Mandeep, and all the other wonderful patron people, uh, patrons. Patreon people. And thank you to all the other wonderful Patreon people. And thank you to all the other wonderful Patreon people. Thank you so much to all of you patrons and also to the special subscribers and the paying subscribers. Oh my god. <laughs> it's just so awkward. Thank you Patreon. Patrons. Just thank you. Oh, okay. And to all the other wonderful patrons. Thank you so much all you patrons. And also a special thanks to the subscribers on the YouTube side as well as the paying subscribers over at Substate. <laughs> Why can't we do this? Fuck. <laughs> you guys. Please. Just thank you. Thank you, everyone, for making this bullshit possible. Thank you to the subscribers. You do it. You did so good. Thanks, guys.